Well, good morning. We're so glad that you chose to join us this first weekend of December for worship. As you came in, I know you saw some of the Christmas lights and decorations. Doesn't the building look fantastic? Yeah. Hey, go ahead and stand. We're gonna start our time of worship this morning by sharing this chorus of adoration and looking to God. Sing this together. Oh, come, let us adore. Love 
do bow before you this morning, O oh Holy Father, King of Kings, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God. We cast it all on you and we thank you for being here, enthroned on the praises of your people. Bless you, Father. You may be seated. Romans 8, 1 through 6 reads, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. In order that the righteousness excuse me, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. That passage describes what we can experience because of Jesus. And in the very first verse, there are two words that we read, no condemnation. Those words are found three times in the New Testament, and all of them are from the book of Romans. To be condemned is to be found guilty in a court of law, but what these words remind us of and what the rest of the passage explains to us is the fact that before God, because of Jesus, we are found innocent. But as we take communion together today, we need to remember that the reason that we are found innocent is because Jesus was found guilty. As we celebrate, as we remember, as we embrace the reality of what life with God is like, we need to remember that the the forgiveness that is free to us cost him dearly. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for the relationship that you make available through your son. And as we take the bread and the juice today, I pray, God, that we would be ever mindful of the price that was paid so that we would be found innocent. In Jesus' name, amen. We know that God is uh, very generous with us, and we're always thankful for that. We always take this time in our service to remember the generosity of God by talking about the opportunity that we have to give back out of that generosity. You can still participate in this in person. We have boxes attached to the walls throughout the building. You can also go to our website if you'd prefer to uh, give in a different way. Now, we also always kind of highlight and challenge uh, you with our Change for a Dollar ministry right now, where we ask you to give $1 extra for every person in your family so that we can take that money and immediately give it away to help someone in need. I'm going to read this week's story for us, and then I'll pray and we'll celebrate as we move into the next part of our service. Amanda is a single mom of two boys, both with special needs. 
And right now, they need to find a new place to live due to some domestic risks that they are dealing with. So Change for Dollars is going to be used to help them with current rent, uh, deposit at a new apartment complex, as well as utility deposits. Uh, Amanda was overwhelmed when she found out about Change for a Dollar, and we are uh, excited and glad that we get the opportunity to come alongside her and her family at this time. Would you pray with me? Uh, God, thank you so much for all that you do for us. Thank you for this chance that we have to give back. I pray that we would always be mindful of it, of the fact that we should do so joyfully, generously, because everything that we have, we are merely stewards of. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's celebrate. Check out MPTV. Hey everyone, I'm Matt, and thanks for joining us this weekend. If you're new or here for the first time, thanks for being here. We'd love to make your time a great experience. If you're joining us online, you'll find a link that your host will put in the chat, or you can just grab your phone and scan this QR code found in your seat backs to get connected. Christmas is right around the corner, and that means it's time to return your Giving Tree gifts. There's still tags available in the comments, but make sure that you return your gifts by next Sunday, December 11th. Don't forget you can also sponsor a child or two through our online giving. Thanks for being generous and helping. Next weekend is gonna be jam-packed with awesome ways to celebrate Christmas. First, don't forget to register your children for our first Winter Wonderland Workshop, where you can get a few hours to Christmas shop while your kids are having tons of fun with us. Head to the events page of npcc.info for all the details and to get your children ages two years through fourth grade registered. Secondly, don't forget to grab some invite cards on your way out to give to your family and your friends for our special Christmas service next weekend. This service is gonna be filled with music and teaching and celebration as we focus on the birth of our Savior. And we're gonna be offering a free professional photo opportunity in the commons after each service. So make sure you dress in your Christmas best and bring someone with you to celebrate. We also hope you will plan to join us for our special candlelight Christmas Eve services on December 24th at 4, 6, and 11 p.m. Childcare will be available for kids kindergarten and younger at our 4 p.m. service only. That's also when we'll have our special children's moment as a part of the service. So make sure you plan ahead and join us for Christmas Eve. Men, this Monday is your final opportunity for 2022 to gather together with Pastor Chris as he wraps up his teaching on an undivided heart in our men's Bible study. Make sure to head to the chapel on Monday at 7 p.m. to join in. In a few weeks, many of you will make resolutions to tidy up the surface matters of your life. But will you make plans to address the deeper matters of your soul? You know, those parts that aren't seen by others but are well known to God? He cares about those things and we do too. So head to the comments today, pick up your 2023 Soul Care Catalog and make a plan for your soul next year. Make sure to stay connected with us on social media and mark your calendars now for our second annual Big Night Out coming on March 10th. More details and registration coming soon. So I hope you took notes because that was a lot of information, but that's all I've got for you now. So let's focus on our message from Pastor Chris as he begins a new series called Searching for Christmas. Good morning, church family. Thanks for being here today. It's good to see all of you. I want to welcome everyone who's joining us in person and all of you folks who are joining us online with an extra special welcome to anyone who might be a guest with us today, whether you're in person or you're joining us online for the very first time. Uh, before we get to the message, there's just a couple of things I want to talk with you about. The first thing I want to do is tell you, if you got a Bible with you, go ahead and let me hear your pages turning to the Gospel of John and the first chapter, because that's where we're going to find ourselves as we come to our time of study today in John chapter 1. And as you just heard on MPTV, we're beginning a brand new message series called Searching for Christmas. But I also want to encourage you, if you haven't already done it, to fill out one of your My 20, 2022 Stewardship Commitment Cards. We just wrapped up uh, our annual teaching on stewardship or how do we manage money in a way that honors God, regardless of how much He's entrusted to us. We want to make sure that we manage it in a way that honors Him. We just wrapped up that teaching last week. We talked about uh, uh, that truth in a series called Money Rules. We talked about the heart rule. We talked about the management rule. We talked about the savings rule. And then last week, our high school pastor, Matt Pineda, 
wrapped up the series with the generosity rule. Uh, you can't read your Bible when it, and uh, look at what it has to say when it comes to managing or stewarding the money that God has entrusted us and not see that God's will for all of us is to be generous. And we want to be generous in a way that makes a difference around the world uh, for building the kingdom. And that's what we do here at Mount Pleasant. And so if you're a member or a longtime attender, really this is a responsibility that you need to embrace the responsibility to support the ministry of this church, which is large and expansive. And so, uh, if you uh, don't have your commitment cards, you can find them right outside the worship center doors on the bookshelves. There's some red and white boxes out there you can drop your commitment card in. We've already received several, but uh, uh, I know there are several that are still to be turned in. So I want to encourage you that way. I also just want to piggyback on the um, MPTV announcement about uh, next weekend in our special Christmas service. We're going to pull out all the stops when it comes to our worship and arts ministry. I'm going to share a message uh, from the scriptures. And it's a, it would be a great, great time to invite a friend to come to church with you. If there's somebody you've been thinking about uh, inviting to church, then next weekend would be a great weekend to do that. And you can pick up the invitation cards uh, outside the worship center. And then also while you're doing it, go ahead and pick up invitation cards for Christmas Eve, uh, as you heard about that in our MPTV announcement as well. We are starting a new message series this weekend called Searching for Christmas. You know, in the last few years, there's been a lot of uh, uh, unhappiness, uh, at times even bordering on conflict in, uh, in the culture of our country today when it comes to Christmas because of what a lot of people have called the war on Christmas. And the war on Christmas is just the way some people uh, uh, look at the reality that so many uh, things in our government, so many businesses, so many retail stores and other things, and so many people seem to have this interest in taking Christ out of Christmas. And oftentimes that focuses primarily on the kind of Christmas greetings that we use. Uh, and, and it just stirs up a lot of conflict and a lot of trouble in people's minds, especially in the minds of believers. But here's what I want to share with you in this December season uh, at Mount Pleasant. Uh, experiencing the reality of Christmas is never going to be about the language we use in our greetings. Experiencing the reality of Christmas is going to be about embracing Jesus. Embracing Jesus for who he is and we're going to talk about that in real clear terms in just a few minutes. And embracing the mission that Jesus was sent in the world for, embracing that mission into our own lives. That's how we experience the reality of Christmas in our lives. Here's the most significant thing that anyone could ever say about Christmas. At Christmas, God became a man. Somebody say amen to that. But I'm afraid sometimes that because many of us have spent our entire lives in church or many years in church, that that truth has lost its power and it's lost its significance in our lives. At Christmas, the eternal God clothed himself in flesh and became a man. And he was born into the world in the most lowly and humble way. And I don't want us to forget either one of those truths, the truth that in Jesus, God became a man or the truth that he came into the world in the most unexpected way. And so, and this will be a little bit different, before I open up my Bible and share with you, I'm going to, I've asked the, Heidi and the band to stay around uh, for a few minutes, and I'm going to ask her to come out here and sing one of my favorite Christmas songs that I think really reminds us in, in strong terms of this miracle of the incarnation, God becoming a man, being born in Bethlehem in the most real, honest, and vulnerable way. I hope this song blesses you the way it blesses me. It was now a silent night. There was blood on the ground. could hear a woman cry in the alleyway that night on the streets of David's town. And the stable was not clean. And the cobblestones were Had no mother's hand to hold. It was a labor of pain. It was a cold sky above. But for the girl on the ground in the dark, with every beat of the beat. 
Well, I threw a little bit of a kink in the production this morning, this weekend, so Heidi, uh, she's uh, multitasking today. <laughs> Leading worship, singing a special, great job, and bringing out my water bottle stand. <laughs> you got to love people who have a servant's heart. Somebody say amen to that. I mean, honestly, what, a, what kind of a blessing was that to hear her sing that song today? That was such a great blessing. Here's what I want all of us to know. Here's what I, all, what, I, what I want all of us to take home with us today when we leave this place. When it comes to searching for Christmas, the real meaning of Christmas, it will always be about so much more than just the words we use in our holiday greetings. It'll be about embracing the reality of who Jesus is and the reality of the mission that he was born into the world for into our everyday lives. In fact, as we begin our time together in the scriptures today, let me just ask you this question. What would Christmas look like for you this year in 2022 if you decided you were going to use the celebration of Jesus' birth to motivate you to know Jesus better than you've ever known him before in your entire life? I have a book in my library upstairs, and probably many of you have this same book because it's been around for a while, or have read this book. It's called The Jesus I Never Knew, written by a man named Philip Yancey, who after decades, don't miss that, after decades of being a Christian, as well as a best-selling Christian author, decided that he didn't know Jesus as well as he should have, and so he devoted himself to studying his life like he had never done before, which resulted in him writing the book, The Jesus I Never Knew. A few years ago, a man named Ed Dobson, who was a pastor up in Grand Rapids, Rapids Michigan, he has since passed away, uh, but he kind of came to the same conclusion that Philip Yancey did. He decided that he needed to, to know Jesus better than he did. He had, needed to have a, a closer, stronger personal identification and relationship with Jesus. And so what he decided to do was to spend one year of his life living as closely as possible the lifestyle that Jesus lived. 
He decided he was going to live like Jesus lived. He was going to eat what Jesus ate. He was going to pray like Jesus prayed. He was going to attend all the same Jewish festivals that Jesus would have attended. And he decided that he was going to read all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every single week for a year. All four Gospels every single week for a year. And at the end of it, some significant things happened in his life. Number one, he grew a really long beard. That was the first thing. Number two, he wrote a book called The Year of Living Like Jesus, which chronicled his experience. And then number three, he said, I knew Jesus better than I'd ever known him before. Now, I'm not suggesting you follow the example of Ed Dobson or, or something like that, but I am suggesting that as we begin this Christmas season that we commit, or maybe for some of us, honestly, we recommit to knowing Jesus, connecting with Jesus in a more personal way than we have ever before. And I want to help you doing that by drawing your attention to some truths about Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and the first 18 verses, which is a, a, an incredible passive scripture. It's, it's, it's John's prologue to his gospel, and it's different from the way Matthew, Mark, and Luke begin, because the Gospel of John is very different anyway. But in the first 18 verses of chapter 1, what John does is he gives us a spiritual introduction to Jesus, and then he gives us an explanation of exactly who Jesus is. And if I were to reduce everything that you can learn from the first 18 verses of John chapter 1 into a single statement, then it would be this, and it would be this simple. Jesus needs to be the central focus of every part of our lives, every part, every part, with no exception. Because being a Christian is not about trying to be good. It's not about following a list of rules related to things that we should do and things that we shouldn't do. It's not about the way we vote. And it's not about the language we use in our Christmas greetings. It's about having a personal, a deeply personal relationship with Jesus, which means it's about having a deeply personal relationship with the living God, because that's who Jesus is. My favorite line in that song that Heidi just sang, without question, is, but the baby in her womb was the maker of the moon. He was the author of the faith who could make the mountains move. That's who Jesus is. And that's how we need to see him and understand him. And so, if you've got your Bible open to John chapter 1 and you're able this morning, go ahead and stand with me for the reading of the Scripture. First 18 verses, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Obviously, John is talking about Jesus here. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace. We have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. But God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made himself known. All right, there it is. You can be seated. We always ask God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. One of the things revealed about Jesus in those, world, in those words is the greatest tragedy 
related to his life, and that's the truth that he came into the world that he created. Don't miss that. But the world didn't recognize him. John chapter 1 and verse 10 said he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Verse 11 goes on to say he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And that's a mistake, friends, that we can't make. That's a mistake that you can't make in this Christmas season. That's a mistake that you don't want anyone that you know and love to make. That's a mistake that we as a church don't want anyone in the world to make. Because when you recognize Jesus for who he is, then you receive him into your life. And when you receive him into your life, you become a part of God's family. John 1.12 went on to say, yet to all those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. But before any of that can happen, in your life, my life, or the life of anyone, you have to know exactly who Jesus is because it's not enough to know about Jesus. You've got to know exactly who he is. Now, obviously, we don't have time to exposit all 18 verses of John chapter 1. If we did, we'd be here till noon. And so, what I'm going to do is just draw three powerful truths out of those 18 verses to remind us or maybe teach us for the very first time of exactly who Jesus is, this Jesus we celebrate in this Christmas season. Number one, if you'd like to take notes, we've already said this, but we're gonna reemphasize it here. Number one, Jesus is the eternal God. Write that down in your notes somewhere. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. If you look at that in your Bible, you'll see that the word, Word there is capitalized. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John is telling us that Jesus was already in existence when the heavens and the earth were created. That means he is not a created being. He is the eternal God who has existed since the beginning of time. And we need to understand that about him because that's what makes his birth into the world so special. I think it's interesting that of all the words that John could have used when he was writing his gospel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he chose to use the word word as his description of Jesus. Now we've talked about this before several times over the years. In the original language of the New Testament, that's the Greek word law. When you look in your Bible at John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see that the word, Word is capitalized because it's a reference to Jesus. And you might think that makes it a really significant word in the Greek language, but it's not. If you wanted to do a word study on the word, Word, then you'd find no shortage of information. But the word that's used there is the Greek word logos, L-O-G-O-S. And reduced to its most simple meaning, it's a word that means speech or communication. And so here's what that means. Here's what John is saying to us when he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was saying Jesus was born into the world to be the physical flesh and blood communication of the eternal God. Why? Because he is the eternal God. He came to help us to see and to help us to know and to help us to understand to the degree that we can in our humanity because we're limited in our humanity, the reality of the eternal God. And while you can know everything there is to know about Jesus, if you don't know and embrace this foundational truth about who he is, then I'm just gonna tell you today, you don't know him at all. Now, someone might hear me say that and say, Pastor, how can you say that? Well, here's my answer, and I want you to listen to me really close. If you don't understand and believe that Jesus is, in fact, the eternal God, then you have no basis for surrendering your life to him. Why would you surrender your life to someone who is not God? And you have no basis for spending the rest of your life worshiping him, which is what we are to do. Think about something with it. Why is it, friends, why is it that so many people today who don't believe in God or who have a bitterness toward God don't have one single good thing to say about God at the same time can have such positive thoughts and positive feelings and positive words about Jesus? Why is it? 
I led a small group along with Rick Neville in our church a, a few years ago on Wednesday nights for several weeks with people. The people in the group all identified as atheists. Nobody in the group said that they were a Christian. In fact, they said just the opposite. They were atheists. And we talked about a lot of different things. We talked about God. We talked about the Bible. We came to that time. We talked about Jesus. While nobody believed in God, nobody had anything but really in a sense, at least on some level of bitterness or even a contempt toward God, everybody, everybody had good things to say about Jesus. Why is it? Why do you think that is? Well, I'll tell you what I think. And I'll also tell you that I think I'm right. <laughs> I think it's because most people see Jesus as just a man. And when they see him as just a man, that means they can see him as a really good man and they can see him as a really kind man and they can see him as a really loving man and they can see him as a really compassionate man. They can see him as a man who is a great moral teacher and storyteller and on and on and on. But what does the Bible say about Jesus? The Bible says that he is the eternal God. And you can't miss that. What are the first words in the Bible? Genesis chapter one and verse one. In the beginning, what? God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What does John chapter one and verse three say? This is our text. This is the prologue to the, to the gospel of John. It says, through him, talking about Jesus, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Jesus is the eternal God. I'm gonna put words up on the screen from the Apostle Paul, Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And if you're not really familiar with your Bible today, that's okay. But let me just tell you, these are, these are divinely inspired words that found them themselves in, or found their way rather into the scriptures because they come straight from God. These words are written by the Apostle Paul. He says, he's talking about Jesus, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him. He's the eternal God. Hebrews chapter one and verse three is one of my favorite verses in all the New Testament about Jesus. It says the son, notice that the word son is capitalized there. The Hebrew writer is talking about Jesus. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And here we see his divinity again, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He not only created the world, but he sustains the world every moment of every hour of every day. But my, one of my favorite parts about this verse are these two words here, exact representation. The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things through his powerful word. Those two words, exact representation, come from one single word in the original language of the New Testament, which of course is the Greek language. It's the Greek word character. Character, and here's what that word means. It's, it's a word that describes what happens or what happened in ancient days when a king or somebody of nobility who had a signet ring with a, with a mark of their nobility or their status, when somebody had a signet ring like that and they imprinted, they pressed it into melted wax to make an imprint. That's exactly what these two words from the Greek word character mean. And so when you understand that, then here's what the Bible is telling us about Jesus, that Jesus is the the perfect personal imprint of God in time and space. I love to think about Jesus like that. He is the perfect personal imprint of God in time and in space. That's who he is. No wonder Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Was, he, was Jesus a good man? Yes, but he was more than a good man. Was he a good teacher? Yes, but he was more than a good teacher. Was he a moral man? Yes, but he was more than just a moral man. He is more than any worldly description that we can give of him. He is the eternal God who existed before his birth in Bethlehem and who continues to live even after his death at Calvary. And here's why we know and believe that's true. Because the Bible teaches us that God has a triune nature. And I don't want you to get lost in that because it sounds a little academic. God has a triune nature. The word that we use in our language to describe that is the word Trinity. Although the word Trinity cannot be found in the Bible, 
But even though the word Trinity cannot be found in the Bible, the concept of the Trinity or the triune nature of God can be found all through the Bible. Here's what it means in simplest terms. We believe the Bible teaches there is one God, everyone say one God, one God who exists at all times in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what it means. Now, that's a whole nother message that I don't have time to talk to you about. But that's how we can know and believe that Jesus is the eternal God, that he has always been along with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He was not created. He is the creator. When he came to earth as God in human flesh, he made the claim that he was God, and then he backed it up. How did he back it up? When his enemies killed him, what did he do three days later? He rose from the dead. And no other religious leader can make that claim because no other religious leader is God in human flesh. Here's the second thing that the, John chapter 1 verses 1 through 18 tell us about Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. Number one, Jesus is the eternal God. Number two, Jesus is the light of the world. I want you to look at one single verse back in John chapter 1 with me. It's John chapter 1 and verse 9. Look there, find that in your passage. John says, and he's talking obviously again about Jesus, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Now, we need to really focus on that word true there to understand what John is trying to tell us in this part of his prologue to his gospel. John says, Jesus is the true light that was coming into the world. The word he uses for true, I'm sorry, but we just have to look at this. It's kind of boring, but we have to look at it for just a moment. In the original language of the New Testament is the Greek word alithinos. And here's the definition, and it's so technical that it's one of those things, when I read it, I, my, my eyes just kind of glazed over, and I said, oh gosh, could you not come up with anything better than that? Or an explanation or a definition better than that. But this is what the definition is if you do a word study. That which has not only the name and semblance, but the real nature corresponding to the name. Well, what in the world does that mean, friends? What in the world does that mean? Here's what it means. It means that up to this point, this, and the point I'm talking about is Jesus getting ready to be born into the world, God begin, getting ready to come into the world in flesh and blood in the person of Jesus. Up to this point, God's people had only seen reflections of God. They had only seen reflections of God's glory. If you go back and you read verses six through eight and then you end in verse nine, the one that we're talking about right now, you'd see that they had seen a reflection of God and a reflection of the glory of God in John the Baptist who was sent into the world to prepare the way for Jesus to come into the world. But when Jesus came into the world, we had the opportunity to see the full reality of God, not just a reflection of God, but the full reality of God, the full reality of God and exactly who he is. I'm gonna put a few, uh, Hebrews, we, we looked at a portion of this. I'm gonna put Hebrews chapter one, verses one through three, uh, at least the first part of verse three up on the screen again. And uh, I, I think this is a parallel passage that makes this even clearer. So the Hebrew writer says, this is how uh, the whole book of Hebrews begins. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Stop right there. What's, what's he saying? In the past, we got reflections of God. We got reflections of the glory of God. We got glimpses of God. We got glimpses of the glory of God. As God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets many times and in various ways. But then we pick it up, it says, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. And then this is the part we read earlier. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation, the perfect personal imprint of God in human space of his being. Well, here's another part of this passage that I really like. I like those words, exact representation. I told you that, but I also like this word radiance right there. The word radiance in the original language of the New Testament is the Greek word apagasma, apagasma. And you can see on the screen what it means. It means light or brightness. So when the Hebrew writer says about Jesus that he is the radiance of God's glory, you know what he's saying? He's saying that when Jesus came into the world, he shone a light on God and the glory of God. He lights up the glory of God with his life because he is God, he reveals God, not just a glimpse of him, not just a faint reflection, but the reality of who he is. And so, going all the way back to John chapter one and verse nine, when John said about Jesus, the true light 
that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He's saying Jesus is coming into the world to shine a light on God for all of us. The reality of God, the truth of God, the love of God, the deliverances of God, the deliverance of God, the promises of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the hope of God, and you can go on and on and on. That's why Jesus is the light of the world. In Matthew chapter 11, there was a moment when Jesus was talking about John the Baptist who, who prepared the way for him. And Jesus says in verse 11 of Matthew 11, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Now you could read that and you can make the case that Jesus is saying that John the Baptist, that before himself, John the Baptist was the greatest man who ever lived because God gave him the most important job in history up to that point, And that was to prepare the way for Jesus. But think about the differences between John the Baptist and Jesus. John the Baptist was a man, Jesus was God. John the Baptist was called by God, Jesus was God. John the Baptist's job was to testify about the true light, Jesus as God is the true light. And so Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem on what we think of as the first Christmas, came into the world as the light of the world because he lit up with his life. He lit up the glory of God. I could talk to you about this more, but we need to move on. There's an incredible story in Gospel of John, the seventh chapter, about one day when the Pharisees got fed up with Jesus. The Pharisees, of course, were the religious leaders who butted heads with Jesus during his entire earthly ministry. And so they they just wanted to be over with, so they sent the temple guards to arrest him. And then the next thing that you really read about is the temple guards return to the Pharisees without having arrested Jesus. And they say, well, what's the deal? Why, why didn't you do what we sent you to do? And, and this was their simple explanation, John 7 and verse 46. They looked at them and they said, no one ever spoke the way this man does. What did they say? We never met anybody like this guy before. We've never talked to anybody. We've never listened to anybody. We've never experienced anybody like this guy before. Why was that? Because Jesus was no ordinary man. He was the eternal God who is the light of the world. And that's what we have to understand if we experience the reality of Christmas. And I hope anybody who's listening to me right now whether you're here in person or in line, uh, joining us online, who feels like there's darkness in their life. Maybe you feel like you're, you're caught in some level of darkness in your life, the darkness of depression, the darkness of, of hopelessness, the darkness of, of questions, the darkness of searching for meaning, whatever level of darkness that you might feel your life surrounded by or you might feel creeping into your life at different levels. If that's you, Jesus is your answer. Let me give you a third thing that the Gospel of John teaches us about Jesus. Jesus is the eternal God. Jesus is the light of the world. Number three, Jesus is the source of grace and truth. He's the source of grace and truth. I look back in John chapter one. I hope you've got your Bible open there still. And in verse 14, John says this about Jesus, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father. Note this, full of grace and truth. John 1, 17, a little bit later says, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You know, there are a lot of people in the world today who think the primary message of God is an angry message and a harsh message, and a judgmental message. But that's simply not the case because he's not an angry God and he's not a harsh God and he's not a judgmental God in the way that people often think. And I preface it like that because I'm I'm compelled, literally compelled to tell you today that the Bible makes it clear there will be a day of judgment that comes for all of us. There will come a day when all of creation, all of creation will give an account for their lives. But here's the good news. If you're a Christian, which is to say if you're somebody who has surrendered your life 
to Jesus. That judgment will come before what the Bible calls the judgment seat of Christ. And it will be a judgment that will be all about evaluation and not about condemnation. Because all of us will have to give an account of our, for our lives, for the good things we did in our lives, for the way we handled the resources and the opportunities and the talents and the gifts that God gave to us. But it will be a time of evaluation, not a time of condemnation. And there's a difference. Remember, my son Andrew was out here just a few minutes ago with a communion meditation based primarily on Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 that says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he talked about what the meaning of condemnation was, that you found guilty according to the law. If you're a Christian, that won't be the reality for you when that day comes. The judgment you will experience will be one of evaluation, not one of condemnation. But if you're not a Christian, the Bible says that there will be a judgment that will be about condemnation. And I want you to listen to me really close because I'm not speaking these words harshly. I'm speaking these words honestly with a heart of concern there will be a judgment for those who are not in Christ Jesus, for those who do not recognize him as the eternal God and the true light of the world and the source of grace and truth, who have not given their lives to him. And that judgment will be about condemnation. The Bible calls it the great white throne judgment. You can read about it in Revelation chapter 20. And so, here's what I want you to focus on on with me for just our last few minutes. If, if, if you're a Christian, which is to say, if you're someone who has accepted and believed this truth that John is revealing to us about Jesus, that he is the eternal God, that he is the true light of the world because he lights up the glory of God, shines a bright light on the glory of God because he is God, and that he is the source of grace and truth, then you can have Jesus change your life for all eternity. Because Jesus didn't come into the world to judge the world. We're so familiar with the words of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But what about the very next verse, John 3, 17, that goes on to say, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save, everyone say save, save the world through him. How about Jesus' own words at the end of his encounter with Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10? Jesus said, for the Son of Man, remember I've told you so many times, that's Jesus' favorite term to use to refer to himself. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. That's who Jesus is. That's who Jesus wants to be for you. There's an old story that I love about a man named St. Jerome who was one of the early church fathers who job or responsibility or what he's known for primarily was translating Greek manuscripts into Latin back in the days before they were printing presses and those kinds of things. He actually lived in the town of Bethlehem because the deep desire of his heart was to live in the same place that Jesus was born. And the story says that one night he had a dream where Jesus visited him. And in the dream, Jerome took all of his money and put it together and he offered to Jesus. And Jesus said, I don't want your money. And so he took all of his possessions. He began to assemble and gather all of his possessions together. And he offered them to Jesus and said, I don't want your possessions either. And so Jerome, in his dream, looked into the face of Jesus and said, then what can I give you? Because he just felt compelled to respond to Jesus' presence, to give him something. He said, so then what can I give you? And Jesus said, give me your sin. Because that's what I came for. I came to take away your sin. And why can Jesus do that? Because he was an ordinary man? Because he's the eternal God. Why was Jesus' one life on the cross enough to satisfy God's need for justice with regard to the sin of all humankind? Because he was an ordinary man? No, because you know what? An ordinary man would have been able to give his life for one other ordinary man. It was because he was the eternal God. And that's why he can say, give me your sin. That's what I came for. I came to take away your sin. 
And so he came into the world as the source of grace and truth. But here's what we need to understand about grace and truth, friends. You can't separate grace from truth, which means you can't experience the grace of God in your life until you face up with the, to the truth that you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. That's probably the only thing that all of us here today have in common because we can be so different in so many other ways. But the one thing we all have in common is none of us are perfect. We've all stumbled. We've all fallen. We've all made mistakes. We've all gone wrong directions and on and on and on. You know, you might be a boring sinner. You might be a spectacular sinner. You might be somewhere in between, but we're all sinners. None of us are perfect. We've all got mistakes and failures in our lives. And so the only way to experience the grace of God, which is the, which is the word that describes the forgiveness of God, is to face up to the truth that that's, that's what you need because that's the only thing that can change your life. And so as believers, that's why you and I, if you are a Christian, that's why you and I have to cling, we need to cling tightly to the truth of God's word, but we need to do it all the while with the heart of grace. And we need to speak the truth of God's word with words of grace. And I'll be the first to say that that can be really difficult to do in a world like the one we live in today where truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth. But that's what we're called to do. And so, as we search for Christmas in December, we remember it's not about superficial things. Like whether you say Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays. In fact, not to diminish the presence of Christ, but on the scale of importance when it comes to Jesus, that is just not very high. As we search for Jesus as in searching for Christmas, then we find him when we recognize that he is the eternal God. He is the light of the world and he is the source of truth and grace. I want you to pray with me this morning. Father, thank you so much for time in your word today. And I pray that my feeble effort to teach it will bear fruit on some level. And we love you and we thank you for who you are. And I hope and pray that we have seen you clearly for who you are today. The God who has a seeking heart, who wants all of us to be a part of your family, who wants us to recognize the need of our life and bring that need to Jesus who can meet it and change our lives for all eternity. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand together. We're gonna to sing one more song before we're dismissed. I'm gonna invite you down. If you're a prayer counselor this morning, I'm gonna invite you to come down. Uh, and um, I'm gonna stand down here myself today which I don't normally do, but I want you to listen to me really close. While there's nobody here who cares more about the prayer concerns of your life, and if you've got a prayer concern on your heart this Christmas season, I mean, it could be a number of different things, honestly. Things in your family, uh, concerns about your future, whatever, then I want you to come and let one of these folks pray for you. But if you're here this morning and you've got questions about whether or not your life is right with God, I want you to come and talk to me, okay? I don't wanna pray with you today. I want you to come and talk to me if you got questions about whether or not your life is right with God.
Would you be seated? We're going to celebrate a baptism together this morning. Good morning. I'm Mary Graham, and this is my sweet friend, Eliana Strelo. And she has come forward to make a public profession of her faith and to follow through with baptism. Are you ready, Eliana? Yeah. Okay. Would you repeat after me, sweetie? Mm -hmm. Say, I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I confess him. And I confess him. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Eliana, I baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What a great way to end our service. Please stand. I have a few announcements just to remind you of before we are dismissed. If you're a guest with us, we're so glad that you're here this morning, and we'd love to meet you in person. Out these doors to the right is an area called Guest Connections. Please come out there and say hello so that we can meet you in person. And then Giving Tree, I know we've said this a couple times this morning already, but if you have tags and you shopped for our annual giving opportunity, please bring those gifts back next weekend. And if you haven't, there are still opportunities to be a part of that. And then we also want to make sure that you bring a friend next weekend. So come back to church next weekend and bring a friend. Have a great Sunday. God bless you.